Well, thank you, Dr. Miller, for letting me come in and ask you some questions. I uh, really love the work that you're doing here. I want to start off with, Ken, if you could tell us a little about your path to Florida State and your work in ecology and specifically community ecology and with picture plants. Uh, well, my father was a biologist. He taught uh, high school biology in New Mexico and Arizona. And uh, then he went out and became a professor at small college. And so I was exposed to a lot of biology when I was a kid. Uh -huh. Also was raised kind of in, in the country in Bear Mountains. I, I came from a ranching family. So I always had kind of an appreciation for all of life. When I was a kid, I did a lot of backpacking and things like that. So I think I always had an interest in ecology. Um, I went to the University of Arizona and then got a PhD from Michigan State. And pretty much, I guess I never, you know, I just thought I couldn't go to the careers. I could become a computer programmer or a photographer or something else. Um, but in reality, I think I was always pretty much directed to being a college professor. Um, and so uh, after I got my PhD at Michigan State, I did a postdoc at the University of Chicago. I did a postdoc in England. And then here, so I've been here since 1989. So I've now lived here longer than any place else in my life. Oh, wow. um, and one of the reasons why I think I liked Tallahassee was because it was like where I grew up. Where I grew up, there was really high diversity of habitats that were easily accessible. And so you, know, you can get the mountains, you can get the lakes, you can get the ocean, you can get different deserts, things like that. Here, it's very easy to get to the salt marshes, to sand beaches, to you know, ravines, to uh, lonely forests. Uh, you can kayak. So there's lots of different habitats that are yeah. accessible here that have really interesting things. And I, I guess we liked it because it's also such a high diversity. This is one of the major conservancies about diversity hotspots is right in the North Florida area. So we have high diversity of everything from snakes and plants. It's been a great place to live. Yeah. And so how come pitcher plants? So what makes them so fascinating? How do they tie into your work? Uh, so pitcher plants I first started working on because they were near uh, high bush blueberries. And so in Michigan, I first time was exposed to pitcher plants because they occurred on bogs where you had blueberries, and we would go just fill huge garbage bags of wild blueberries every year and survive all winter on blueberries because they, they didn't pay us very well as graduate students. And um, so I first saw the, the pitcher plants there and just thought they were really cool. And uh, I looked up enough about them to know that. If you look inside of them, you can actually see different larvae in there. So fly larvae, both mosquito larvae and flesh fly larvae, you can actually see in the bees. And so I started thinking, oh, this is kind of a cool system. Uh, but honestly, I actually started looking at it because of a class. And so I was teaching a class in Michigan for the summer, a field class. And we were looking for a system that was kind of interesting to play around with. So I had the students uh, do a, a quick experiment looking at the flesh flies and then inside the pitcher plants. When I moved down here, I was working on something completely different. I was working on evolution of competitability of plants, and I had a big grant work in the greenhouse that was incredibly boring because you just, I mean, I'm in Tallahassee and I'm working in a greenhouse for eight hours a day, and it was just awful. And um, so when I, again, when I taught a graduate class, I thought, oh, let's go do something fun with them. And so yeah. I remembered that your plants were here too. I have seen them here. Yeah. So I switched back to working at that. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason is just that I'm a community ecologist. And so a community ecologist's job is basically to explain biodiversity. And we're trying to figure out why are there so many plants? Why are there so many animals? And it's actually not that simple. It's not why are there so many. It's why are there a given number? So if you go out in, uh, in the lawn in front of your house and look down, and probably in a meter square, you could find eight or 10 species, at least in my lawn. Why eight or 10? Why not? You know, why not one? Why isn't that one grass that's best able to grow there? Why doesn't that compete with everything else? Well, why not 20? I mean, why eight or nine? And yeah. So what a community ecologist largely does is try to figure out what explains why things coexist, why things are extinct. So what, what explains biodiversity? And it's hard to find a system to do that in at appropriate, that, that operates at appropriate space and time scales. Yeah. And pitcher plants work at really great space and time scales for experiments. First of all, you have a, you have a whole food web, and so you have a mosquito larvae that protozoa and rotifers that eat bacteria, that eat dead bugs. You've got discrete trophic levels. Um, the longest generation times are about two and a half hours. Well, mosquito generation times can be up to a couple of weeks, but they don't go through multiple generations. The protozoa, it's like eight hours. Rotifers, yeah. it's about two and a half days. So it's really fast dynamics. You can do 
do manipulations and see fast uh, uh, responses. And also, it's one in which you can do easy manipulations. So you can suck out the contents of the leaf and do manipulations, put it back in the leaf, and follow that community for a while. So if I wanted to work on lake systems or forested communities, it would be really difficult to do. If I want to work on a community inside of a pitcher plant, it's really easy. It's easy to do, and if I go out in the field and there's you know, 5,000 plants in that field, each one of them has five or six good leaves on it, and so that's, that's you know 2,500 little experimental units. Okay. So it's a great system to work in as an experiment. And it's a great system to work in with students. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's got a yucky aspect to it. It's got a cool aspect to it. And so I found it for lots of reasons it's kind of a great system to work in. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the unique adaptations of pitcher plants? Or even, you know, why they're so slippery or um, uh, how they grow in the soils they do? Yeah, so Carnivorous plants in general is where you have to start with that. Carnivorous plants in general uh, are thought to evolve because they're looking for an alternate source for nutrients. And so uh, carnivory involves plants capturing insects and then they break down those insects in some way and absorb something from them, just like you do in your own gut. In this case, however, what they're absorbing from it is just the nutrients. When you take in food, you're, you're taking in both the energy and the nutrients. Okay. They're getting energy from being photosynthetic, so they don't need that. And so they're really just getting nutrients. And so by doing so, what they're doing is they're replacing root function. So capturing dead bugs by having these exotic uh, adaptations, whether it's hairs, whether it's a pitfall trap, whether it's Venus flytrap, all those adaptations are to get nutrients and to replace root function, at least that part of the root function. The roots are still important, the roots can still absorb nutrients if they're there. Um, but the roots are primarily to absorb water and provide an anchor for the plant or yeah. anything else. Uh, so, because of that, then you think, well, why would they need that? Why, why you know, they're sacrificing a lot of leaf area to, to replace root function. So, what's the benefit? The benefit is that they grow in places where there's very low nutrients. There aren't nutrients in the soil, and so they're looking for a better source. So, carnivorous plants in general, worldwide, in lots and lots of different habitats, they grow in these specific habitats because these are low nutrient habitats. They may be low nutrient because, like as here, they're very sandy soils. Yeah. Could be low nutrient because uh, in South America they're on top of these rock pillars where they're kind of growing out of the rock up on the top of the buoys. Um, uh, or it could be like in most areas of the world, it really is, has to do with bog dynamics. And in bog dynamics, what you have is a very uh, wet but highly acidic environment. And so plants grow there, but when they die, they fall in the water and they don't rot. And so the nutrients are tied up in plant biomass, they're not released back out into the environment. So there are lots of nutrients there, but they're tied up still with dead plant material, and they're not being released into the ecosystem in a way that the plants can take them back up again. So there's low nitrogen availability, even if there's low nitrogen, even if there's lots of nitrogen there. It's mostly nitrogen and phosphorus in the big case. And again, there's lots of them there, it's just tied up in dead plant material. So there's low nitrogen availability. So carnivory slots have evolved in large part to allow plants to get nitrogen. Okay. Now how about, um, I know I'd heard you talk before about pitcher plants and evolution and specifically convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, we live in an interesting time because of molecular genetics. So, you know, we can, uh, you, you can take all the plants in the world and sequence them. And then you can use that to see who's related to who. And it's just like you can imagine if you sequence everybody who lives, everybody in Leon High School or something, right? You could, by looking at who's similar to whom in terms of their genotypes, you can see who's related to whom. And so you can do that with the whole family of plants. And when you do that, you're like, okay, now if I look at this whole family, you know, if you did it at uh, 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 high school or something, and you asked, okay, you know, who has a widow's peak or who has blue eyes or who has certain family traits, a big nose or something like that. You could follow family traits through that tree and see how that's passed on through families as well. So you can do the same thing with plants. I mean, if you use carnivory as the trait you want to look at instead of a big nose, what you can see is that carnivory is something that's involved, evolved probably six different times across all the plant kingdom. Wow. Which is really interesting. Yeah. You know, we tend to think of things like carnivory as being kind of bizarre, so maybe they only evolved once, but in fact, it's evolved several times. So that means that probably there's really strong selection for it in different parts of the world, and that there's a lot of genetic variation for it. And so yeah. 
that also helps explain why there's so many different ways in which things are carnivorous. And so some plants have evolved to be carnivorous by having sticky hairs on them. Some like pitcher plants have evolved because there's a pitfall trap and the wings fall into a trap and can't get out. Yeah. And others have active traps, that things that actually snap or close around insects, like a Venus fly trap. Um, and so uh, those have evolved in different parts of the plant kingdom. What's interesting about pitcher plants is that they've actually evolved at least three different times. So amongst those six different origins of carnivorous plants, three of them involve pitcher plants of different types. One in Australia, where there's I think only one species in Australia, so it's, it's you know, a relic. But it ties out best to hit the line. Yeah. Um, there's about 150 species, I think, of uh, Nepenthes in Indonesia, Borneo, and Southeast Asia, different countries. Um, because of the way the continents split up, there's actually some in Madagascar, there's some in India, India uh, as well, that all came from that, yeah. that origin point as well. And then there's a third group, is the New World Pitcher Plants. And so there's uh, some in uh, Northern South America, and there's some in the Southeast United States, and then there's one species in California and Oregon. Originally, all probably came from Northern South America and then spread from there. And so uh, they all are remarkably similar. They, they, you know, they, a lot of them make a tube that holds about you know, a half cup of water. It's got a funny little lid on the top. It has this thick lip on the front that often makes nectar to attract insects. And so they're, they're really similar in some ways to look at those, the uh, three groups that are converged on the same type, even though they're really not any more related to us than our corn plant, or to each other than a corn plant is to a begonia. Oh, uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. Now how about in Florida or locally? How many different species do we have and which ones are you working with? So we have about 31 different species of carnivorous plants and that involves everything from being a supply trap, which is kind of basic around here, to pitch plants. Um, there are five species of pitch plants near here, uh, kind of six, depending on how you want to count, which you want to call them here. Uh, and they range from you know, tall ones, up to a meter tall. They're just gorgeous, kind of lemon yellow, sarsenia so flava, uh, the trumpet pitcher plant, uh, to uh, the, so a couple of prostrate species that you don't even see much, you might not notice unless you're looking for, and that would be sarsenia uh, sedicina, the trap plant, and then sarsenia fabria, which is the species I work with, which is the purple pitcher plant. And this is kind of being nestled down in the grass, you might not notice it, it's a pretty conspicuous plant. Um, they, because they have these really different shapes, they really uh, have evolved to capture different types of insects, so the tall ones are kind of flower mimic, they actually produce a scent and they're attracting things to, to come to the top of the plant and then fall down in the street where they can't get out. Um, Whereas my species is a specialist. In the, I, I work primarily with the purple pitcher plant, so it's appropriate. And it attracts ants. It's a definite ant specialist. And so it will occasionally capture other insects, but it makes nectar and uh, attracts a lot of fire ants around here, for example. And you can capture quite a few ants. And so, what kind of studies are you and your uh, students doing with uh, Cirrusinia purpurea? Purpurea. purpurea. Yeah, it's purpurea, or some people are suggesting that the species down here is actually a different species, so they're calling it rosea, Saracenia rosea. So I, I, I'll leave that to the experts on yeah. speciation as to whether it's rosea or purpurea, but we call it purpurea, or the purple pitcher plant. Um, purpurea is the only one that actually fills it with water and drowns stuff in the water. The other ones have other mechanisms to keep things from getting out of that, that pitcher that they make in the sun. Yeah. And so, uh, and in that water, again, as I described before, it has, there's a whole food web which you kind of have uh, energy coming into this community from dead ants that fall in the pitcher and drown. And those are consumed by bacteria, those are consumed by, by protozoa, a bunch of other kind of microorganisms. So you can see them with the naked eye, the really big ones, but just barely. And then those are all eaten by larvae of several different And so there's a nice little trophic structure. And so we've been using that to kind of ask some basic questions about community ecology, being able to determine species diversity. And so, for example, um, a lot of theory about community ecology talks about whether or not what limits the number of species is how much energy that's coming into a community or how much predator control we have on the top. And so again, you can think of this as being, oh, you know, either like a bass lake, right? And so you've got bass and the top predators and they eat smaller fish and the smaller fish eat so plank and then they eat phytoplankton. But what's going to give you, what's going to affect that ecosystem more? The fact that you have a certain amount of nutrients coming in that are feeding that phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. 
or is it going to be the fact that you've got bass in that lake that are eating down all those other fish? So, right. and, and so that's called bottom up and top down controls. Bottom up are nutrients and energy coming into the system, whereas top down are the predators keeping things down in the system. And so there's been kind of a lot of discussion about which of those is more important. And when each one might be more important, but it's hard to test because you, it's hard to go into a lake and kill all the bass. Uh, nobody's going to like that. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to uh, dump a bunch of nutrients in the lake. They're definitely not going to like that. But it's easy for us to do in a picture plan because I can just throw dead bugs in like the bottom up experiment. I can take away the mosquito larvae because I've done a top down experiment. So it's, it's really nice to do experiments. And, um, so when we do those sorts of experiments, what you find is that it depends on the species. Some species in the community are just affected by top up forces, some are just affected by bottom down forces, and some are affected by both. Do you see other extensions or you know, connections or applications of your work outside of community ecology at all? Well, I, I should add that, that we do all that stuff, so that's just kind of the okay. first stuff we do. And then I'll get to that. Um, so the other thing we've done is, you know, because it's such a nice model system that tests kind of basic concepts of community ecology, we've also tested things like dispersal. So let's do a top down, bottom up. Maybe what's really important is the fact that. Uh, whether or not things can get to a community at all, or whether the community is dispersal, or there's a spatial scale question. Maybe what's going on is you can't just understand that one leaf. You've got to know what's going on in all the leaves because there's movement among the leaves. So it's not really one community, it's a bigger community, which is called okay. a meta community. Down there. And so maybe the only way to understand that one community is to have to understand the whole meta community. So uh, we can do experiments with that. I can just send out students with pipette they can just move fluid from leaf to leaf. We can do that at different rates and see how that affects the communities. Um, and then finally, we've also been using these communities now to study evolution. And so certainly there's a role for evolution in explaining diversity. Uh, so Darwin's finches type ideas. We can get a lot of stuff coexist because they've all evolved to be different enough that they can coexist. And so we're actually using uh, picture plants now to study evolution. So I to see Darwin was right. Uh, if the yeah. pitches have evolved, become different, and that's what allows them to coexist. Because we can actually follow in situ evolution. We can actually, just over a matter of a month or so, see whether or not the photos are evolving to be different from one another in terms of their growth rates, their competitiveness, uh, size, or size, their swimming speed, things like that. The practical application of this. So, a lot of what we're doing, and my only intent for doing a lot of this, is that I'm a basic research scientist, and so uh, I have the luxury of looking at the world around me and saying, how does it work? That's my only job. Uh, I mean, I'm a teacher of Florida State too, but uh, in terms of research, uh, as a basic research scientist, my job is to look at the world around me and figure out how it works. It is the greatest job in the world. It is really cool. Uh, but this is what an astrophysicist do. Does, right? I mean, they're just yeah. looking at the stars and saying, geez, how does that work? Um, it's what a you know, climatologist does, I mean, you know, a geologist does. You know, they're looking at uh, a mountain and say, how did that get that way? And so that's what we do, it's a really cool job. Um, and so I don't have to think about the practical application of what I do. And I, I think it's important to make that distinction. You know, somebody, if, if, if you look at every advance in modern medicine, you could think of didn't start because somebody wanted to try to cure a disease. It started because of basic science. Science. So, you know, uh, you know, anything really fancy now, like DNA manipulation to try to cure diseases. Yeah. Well, Watson and Crick, and, and Roslyn, 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 they were, they were not looking at DNA to try to figure out how to cure diseases. They were looking at the world around them and just trying to figure out how DNA works. They weren't trying to do anything about that as a curing problem and helping mankind they were just trying to figure out how the world works. So unless you have basic research, you will not make it major advances in any science. Um, okay, having said that, right? Having, you know, I think I you know, this this strong inner faith in uh, basic research, and, I, and how I just feel it's just not appreciated, uh, and I'm very concerned that it's not appreciated very well. I'm really aware of some practical applications of my research, and I love when it's used for that. Yeah. And so, for example, the top-down, bottom-up questions for anybody doing management type stuff and wants to know, geez, should I fertilize the lake and put nutrients in or should I control the top predators? Our research has something to say about that. 
uh, people who are interested in trying to um, save endangered species are often worried about, should I worry about my, my, I've got an endangered woodpecker in a forest, should I think about maybe making corridors to connect it to other forests? Because if I do, then I can get a bigger meta community and I can allow bird movement, and maybe that's what will allow my species to persist. Yeah. Well, we can do actual experiments and say when those sorts of levels of dispersal among communities are important or not. Yeah. Um, so a lot of what we do does have practical application. A lot of stuff we're doing now in kind of evolution in microorganism systems can also be important for things like medicine, understanding the, the guts in your stomach. So you probably have you know, three to 4,000 species, or what we call operational taxonomic units, because we're not sure they're really species, yeah. of bacteria in your gut. You know, there's, there's many, many more cells of bacteria in your body than you have human cells. You're basically just a big bag of bacteria. And there's like three or 4,000 different species of bacteria. Yeah. Why? How? The 3,000 different niches in some way that allows that coexistence of all of that, that bacteria. Is there that much specialization? You know, there's something else going on because those things are evolving all the time. Every time you take a new antibiotic, those bacteria have to evolve or, or go extinct because that antibiotic is your thing. Yeah. And so there's a lot of evolution going on there. And that's what we're actually studying now with protozoan fissure plants is kind of that level of evolution. What allows you to get a coexistence of a bunch of species as you follow them through evolutionary time? So I think there's a, a, a you know, huge amount of application, um, and I think it's wonderful. I don't do it. Yeah. Well, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for your time, for your amazing work, and for helping us to understand uh, all it is that you're doing. Sure. Right. Thank you. <laughs>